Welcome everybody to lesson 11 of our friendly introduction to abstract algebra and in today's video we are going to learn about a very very important concept. You're going to learn what a group homomorphism is and we will take a look at some easy examples of homomorphisms. Okay, in this chapter has the title homomo what? Because I remember when I first heard the word homomorphism, I thought, whoa, well, that sounds scary or difficult, but uh, it really is not. So what are we talking about? Let me give you the big picture. Okay, without uh, defining these terms here precisely, we right now are in the category of groups. And in this category, there are the objects namely the groups. We have seen several examples, the integer modulo n, the dihedral groups, symmetric groups, um, group of uh, invertible matrices and so on. And then there are the so-called morphisms. Those are the maps between those objects here. And those maps actually help a lot in studying the structure of these objects. Without those maps, it would be very hard uh, to develop a satisfying theory of these objects here. So, category consists of objects and morphisms between those objects. Now here, we have a so-called algebraic structure, meaning we have a set together with an operation. And in this case, in the category of uh, groups, um, the operation satisfies the three group axioms. Yeah, here, for example, the operation is addition of residue classes. Here, the operation is composition of symmetries. Here, the operation is composition of permutations. Here, it is matrix uh, multiplication and so on. And now, a morphism must, in some sense, respect this structure here or the operation on this structure. By that I mean the following. Let's take a look at an easy example. I define the map pi from the integers to the integers modulo n, simply sending an integer to its residue class mod n. Now, besides being a well-defined map from here to here, pi has a very important uh, property, namely that it respects the group operation in the following sense. I'm not entirely sure if this is the correct choice of word. Maybe preserves, I don't know. So I can add two integers here in Z and then apply this map. But I could also apply this map first and then add the images, but not in Z, but here in Zn, because those are residue classes. And we are going to see shortly that this is indeed true, simply by the definition of the addition of residue classes. But this here shows that this pi respects the, the structure on both sides or the operation here and here. And this is a fundamental property. So we're not looking simply at maps from one group to another, but we're always looking at maps that satisfy this condition here. And Pinter called uh, the concept of a morphism, or here um, in particular group homomorphism, one of the skeleton keys of algebra. That's too good not to quote. Or what other categories are there? If you know about vector spaces as objects, then the morphisms would be the linear maps or linear transformations. They respect the linear structure of the vector space. Or if you're in the category of, say, topological spaces, then you would have the continuous maps, respecting the topological structure in some sense, and so on. So this is a whole field of math category theory, which I'm not going to even uh, touch. But I think it's nice to see here uh, these two aspects of uh, studying groups. All right, now for the formal definition. What are homomorphisms? We take a group G with operation a little circle and a group H with operation a little heart. And then a homomorphism simply is a map phi from G to H that satisfies, as explained here, the following condition. It does not matter if I 
compose the elements first in G, so here A, circ B, and then map them using phi, or if I first map A and B separately into H, and then compose the images in H. Heart is the composition or the operation in H, and circle the comp composition in G, and if this is true for all elements of G, then this map here is called a homomorphism. So as I said here, it somehow respects the, the group operation. Now we haven't really talked about injective, surjective, bijective. Now for the viewers that have no clue what this really is, there will be a separate lesson, maybe in the next video, where we talk about this, because here it becomes essential. If you have already heard what that means, then this definition here is for you. If phi is from G onto H, or in other words, if phi is surjective, then we say that H, this group here, is a homomorphic image of G. And this will be a very important concept later on. But for now, it's, it's not so bad if you do not understand uh, completely what that means. All right, let's take a look at some examples. Are there homomorphisms? Well, yes, of course, and there's always the trivial homomorphism, and as the name already suggests, it's not very interesting or useful, but it is there. So as a first example, we take a look um, at the trivial homomorphism, always G and H are groups. So if I simply map every element of G to the identity of H, I get a homomorphism. Why? We use this definition, we take a look at phi of A composed with B. This is always the identity of H by definition because this is an element of G. But now I can write the identity as identity composed in H with the identity, but this is by definition of phi phi of A composed with phi of B, and this is true for all A, B in G, so clearly this is a homomorphism. But I think we're never going to talk about that again because, or maybe for some simple examples when we talk about image and kernel later on. Okay, now the next example is essentially that, but for the special case n equals 2, pi maps the integers to the integers mod 2, which simply consists of two residue classes, the residue class of 0 and the residue class of 1. And k is simply mapped to k bar, or here this notation that we used before, which is the residue class mod 2. So let's see if this is a homomorphism. So if I take two integers, k and l, and add them first in the integers and then apply pi, this is by definition the residue class of k plus l. But if you read that backwards, this was simply our definition for addition in this uh, residue group here, or the, the integers mod 2, because we defined the sum of two residue classes to be exactly that. Take the sum of two representatives and then take the residue class. We showed that this is well defined and so on and gives uh, this set here the structure of a group. So this here is very important to understand. And now this is by definition pi of k plus pi of l. And this is true for all integers. So this shows that pi is a homomorphism. To make this even more clear, I write here, this is addition in the integers, the ordinary addition, whereas this here is addition in z2, z modulo 2z. Okay, so this is exactly what we have here. And as you can see, the composition can be written additively or with any symbol that you wish. It's important that we have this property no matter what the notation is. Now let's talk a bit about what happens here. 
Now clearly this is onto because both are surjective, both elements are being hit by pi. For example, if I map zero, I end up with the residue class of zero. If I map one with pi, I end up with the residue class of one. So both of, both of those are being hit by pi. And this means it's objective. So this here is a homomorphic image of the integers. But of course, this is much smaller. Here we have an infinite set, we have, here we have a set consisting only of two elements. So a lot of properties of the integers must get lost in this process. For example, the relation if one integer is greater than another, they can both be mapped to the same element. For example, eight is greater than six, but both are being mapped to the residue class of zero. But there is one aspect that um, is preserved by this pi. Here, an aspect of the structure that remains intact. And that is the structure of even and odd numbers. So you could call pi a forgetful map or whatever. It forgets all the aspects of the integers, except for their so-called parity. This means exactly if they are even or odd. And even more, it preserves the arithmetic. What I mean by that is the following. That's exactly what is in this definition here. Let me show you what I mean by that in an example. So here in the integers we have that an even number plus an odd number always gives you an odd number, right? Now if we apply pi to that, this is st still true in the following sense. Even gets mapped to the residue class of zero, odd gets mapped to the residue class of one. And now if I add here, I also end up with one bar which corresponds to odd. This is what I mean by preserving the arithmetic. Okay, if this all seems somewhat strange and you don't really know where this is going, that's no problem. It's going to take some time to really get used to working with homomorphisms, but believe me, it's essential for all of algebra. Okay, now two final examples. We take the complex numbers without a zero, C star with a normal multiplication. If you don't know about complex numbers, they will be useful as examples in some instances, but it's not too bad if you haven't heard about complex numbers. If you want to learn something, take a look at uh, this playlist here. Um, it's also in English and contains a lot of information about the complex numbers. So we take the complex numbers without zero and here as our image group, we take the positive real numbers also together with uh, multiplication, which also clearly is a group. And we simply map a complex number to its absolute value. Then, phi of z times w is the absolute value of z times w, but the absolute value is multiplicative. So we end up with this here, which means exactly that this phi is a homomorphism. And be aware that here, this dot means multiplication of complex numbers, so in this group, whereas this multiplication means multiplication of non-negative or positive real numbers. So those are the two different group operations here. Now, if you remember that the absolute value is the square root of the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared, this is pretty tedious um, to prove. So here's a faster proof. The absolute value of a complex number squared is always the number times its complex conjugate. But conjugation is multiplicative, so I can write this like that. And now multiplication, of course, here is commutative, so I can write this like that and this like that. And now if I take the square root here, I end up with this. And square root is allowed because those are non-negative numbers. Okay, but as I've said, if you don't know much about complex numbers, simply forget this example. The same is true for the next example. If you do not have a background in linear algebra, then ignore the matrix examples. It's 
not too bad. Um, if you don't have these examples, you can still learn the key concepts of group theory without those. But if you know about linear algebra, then you know that the determinant is multiplicative. And this means nothing else than that the determinant is a group homomorphism from this group, of, co of course with a matrix multiplication as operation, to this group here, the non-zero elements of the field F together with multiplication. So here we have matrix multiplication and here we have the multiplication in our field. And this is the well-known multiplicative property of the determinant. So this is another example for a homomorphism. Okay, that is already it for this week's lesson. As always, do the exercises on problem set 11. You will find uh, some more elementary examples of homomorphisms and you will prove some fundamental and elementary properties of homomorphisms. So please take a good look at problem set number 11 and have some fun with it. I will see you in the solution videos or in next week's lesson. Bye-bye.